When did you find that you had a cult? Alan? <laughs> I didn't find out until Andre <laughs> said, have they not invited you to one of these cons? And I said, what con, man? And he said, we got a thing going here. Our first member of the squad is an actor, writer, and producer whose credits include Sidekicks, Short Ends, and Kids Incorporated. Today, he joins us to discuss the role of bow-wielding badass Rudy Holleran. Please welcome Ryan Lambert. Hey. Hey, everybody. Yeah, uh, how you doing, boss? I even knew his last name. That's pretty impressive. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I try to do my due diligence and remembrance, and, you know, I'm... Big, big fan of the movie, you know, big, big fan of everybody involved. Big fan of Shane Blood. We'll get in that later. Anyway, Ryan, how are you doing, bro? I'm great, man. All good. Just trapped in my apartment, but I'm oh. fine. Along <laughs> with it. Well, like I said, fine is the new awesome in today's Topsy Turvy world. So we will take that as a win. Okay. All right. Yep. Our next guest, she is an actress whose roles include Family of Spies, Paranormal Burbank, and Smoky Mountain Christmas. Today, she joins us to talk about her role as a version and the befriender of Frankenstein's monster as Phoebe Crenshaw. Please welcome Ashley Bank. Hey. Hey. Good. How are you? You know, trapped in an apartment with two small children and a husband. So we're, uh, we're, we're, we're still married, so that's good. I, I, yeah. Th that, that that is good. That's good. The the husband's still alive. The, the kids are still kicking. Well, everyone's still alive, so we're we're doing great. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for joining us here. Absolutely wonderful to have you. Our next guest is an actor and filmmaker whose body of work includes Mr. President, The Wizard, and the Man in the Santa Claus suit. Today he joins us to discuss the role of leader of the squad as Sean Crenshaw and the director of Wolfman's Got Nars. Please welcome Andre Gower. Hey Patty. Hey, how you doing, boss? I am doing pretty good, uh, despite you know everything else that's going on. I can't complain too, too much, so that's a good thing. You have had a very busy week, young man. <laughs> it's been, yes, this week has definitely been busy. So uh, it, it's fun to you know take a break from you know doing a little of that to doing a little something different with this, which is uh, which is fun to interact with everybody a little bit. Absolutely, we're glad to have you here, and uh, when we get everybody in, we'll definitely be talking about the movie, and we're definitely gonna be talking about Wolfman's Got Nards because there's some good stories behind that. Our next guest is an actor whose credits include Nightwing, Cagney and Lacey, Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. Today, he joins us to discuss the role of brave yet beleaguered detective Dale Crenshaw. Please welcome Stephen Mack. Hi, everybody. Hey, how you doing, boss? Really good, really good, really good. Um, my children are all out of the house, married and grandchildren. So it's just me and my wife. And it's funny how, uh, you know, it's much more intimate than it has been for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, life goals, kids, if you're listening, life goals. Okay. All right. And this is our squad. And now let's bring out our monsters. He is an actor whose roles include Batman and Robin, The Battle of Shaker Heights, and the incredibly undervalued film Cast a Deadly Spell. Today he joins us to discuss his role as the mummy. Please welcome Michael Reed McKay. Hey. Hey. How you doing, sir? How you doing? I am well. How are you doing in your part of the world? Very good. Very good, very good. Hanging in. Doing the best I can. Yep. <laughs> As absolutely we all are. <laughs> and finally, he is an actor, writer, and artist yeah. whose amazing body of work includes Mazes and Monsters, My Wicked Wicked Ways, The Legend of Errol Flynn, V the Series, The Visitors Are Not Our Friends, and of course, a beloved performance as Zorro. Today, however, he joins us to discuss the role as the Prince of Darkness himself, Count Dracula. Please welcome Duncan Regeer. Hi, everybody. Hey. hey. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great today. Um, I'm in You're my little cave. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, where I belong. Um, I just I just received news about two minutes ago that the show that I've been working on, uh, uh, a series of paintings called Anonymous, just got picked up for another week. So I'm I'm very happy in this moment. You just yeah. Me, right? yeah. So. And yeah. Uh, you have a you have a website that uh, uh, so your artwork is available, correct? Oh, I think there's a couple. There's a couple of websites. There's uh, DuncanRegeerArtworks.com. Um, and then just DuncanRegeer.com also gets you through to that. Yeah. 
All right, absolutely. I had the pleasure of looking at some of your stuff this week, and I was I was very very impressed and very touched. Oh, thanks. Uh, absolutely, no, I've, uh, no, thank you, sir. It's it's good art is 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 a good thing in the world, especially a weary one like we're in right now. So oh, sure. it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it, right? Indeed. And speaking of dirty jobs, another dirty job is like slaying monsters. Uh, oh, oh, all right. Now I'm uh, now I'm now I'm back in my office. Okay. First of all, gentlemen and lady, thank you for joining us here at the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Uh, we here at GalaxyCon, we missed the opportunity being able to host you at our physical stages, getting you on our stages in front of your fans. Until the meantime, we have this wonderful internet forum, and we're so glad to have you here. And as a fan. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful, amazing, gory, bloody, fantastic action adventure film that has incredible heart. Thank you all. Thank really. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So uh, I know you talk about a little bit of this in the uh, in the documentary, but what I'd like to hear is that the movie the movie was made, the movie came out, and then the movie did not uh, perhaps hit expectations. But when did you all become aware, or maybe you weren't aware, that the movie was developing a second life, either through uh, cable syndication or in VHS uh, uh, sales? In other words, when did you find that you had a cult? <laughs> I didn't find out until Andre <laughs> said, have they not invited you to one of these cons? And I said, what con, man? And he said, we got a thing going here. I said, Andre, tip my Yankee cap to you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, Stephen started joining us a, a, a little bit after it really started, but I think it was really, obviously, we didn't really know the scope of it until Ashley, Ryan, and I, uh, and Fred ended up doing a reunion screening in 2006, I think, at the original Alamo Draft House in Austin, Texas. I think that was the one event that really kind of, you know, sparked the resurgence yeah, I mean, we were like, I hope people come. It's Easter Sunday. <laughs> there was like a line around the block, two sold out screenings, and we all looked at each other. Like, oh. <laughs> uh, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, so from there, you sort of hit the ground uh, running. And uh, how did how did Wolfman's Got Nards uh, come about? When what was your original inspiration for it? Well, it was really. You know, obviously, you know, you go all the way back to that seminal event at the Alamo Draft House. <clears throat> and then, you know, I don't think any of us, you know, that's on the screen when we started doing conventions and and appearances at screenings would thought uh, would think that would last as long as it had. We all kind of thought it would get a year or two, maybe three or something out of it. And it just never waned or slowed down. It just kept getting kind of bigger and bolder. But, you know, the idea and the kind of inspiration for, you know, the documentary became really hearing the stories of the fan of these fans that would come up to us at these appearances and you know just kind of share their personal stories of how this movie monster squad connected and impacted their lives and we thought it was neat for a while but boy as, as it kept growing and growing and growing it those stories just got more more personal and deeper and you know, we all sat around and talked about it of how crazy this kind of impact that this film had on these people and you know, I, I thought those stories were a story. No, absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. What's been uh, for each of you? What's been your favorite memory, or what's become a favorite memory from being associated with Monster Squad? Ooh. Either you know, during the film or or meeting a, a fan afterwards. For, I you mean with fans, but but you know, part of the joy of being in this thing is is being with the cast. For me, I mean, meeting up with these people who become friends over the years, it's just, it's wonderful. And then we all kind of share extra friends in the, the fans of the show and and delightful seeing the generations that come through. It's, it's you know, it's a wonderful thing and a wonderful feeling. Fair. My favorite memory, and it's imprinted on my, always at one of these cons, some little kid, five years old, comes up with a Jason mask on his face, which scares the shit out of me every time I see a kid like that. And he says, can I have your autograph? What do you think of Monster Squad? And I said, you'll never make that film again because there are too many monsters like you running around out there for real. I mean, it just is imprinted on my, you know, on my psyche, this kid who identifies with Jason. And again, my comment always is in, you know, in, in stuff like this is 
our picture is a beautiful, idyllic little thing at a time when, you know, it was possible for kids to get together and in their mind's eye defeat the dragons and the bastards of the world. But that's not the way it is now. You, I don't think this, this film would last a second, uh, only as a nostalgia film. But I think it's, it says, go out there and get the real monsters of the world. And by doing that, vote on November 3rd. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> well spoken. Yeah. Uh, who's got another one? I remember, God, there's so many small little pieces, but I remember at the first screening we did at Alamo Draft House, there was one woman who sat in the front row and raised her hand and she said, Phoebe, meet Phoebe. And she had named her daughter after my character in the movie. And I was so shocked. Um, and moved and touched. And uh, and I just think every time I meet somebody who talks about how like they were bullied at school or they didn't feel like they fit in and they would watch the movie and feel better, it always just makes you feel, it always makes me feel like um, so proud to have participated in something that has brought so many people so much joy and solid. Fair, absolutely fair. Ryan, how about you? You guys, I'm, I'm having a little te technical difficulties over here. Can you hear me? No problem. <laughs> we can hear you, boss. I can't hear you guys at all. I'm so sorry. Ooh. I'm going to go and try to fix it, and I promise I'll be right back. No problem, brother. We'll be here. <laughs> uh, well, how about, how about you, Andre? You know, I, you know, it's, it's the, the, those little things like Steven mentioned, the little kids, you know, the masks and, and, and Ashley's, you know, kind of Phoebe baby named uh, anecdotes. You know, we all have those that kind of pepper your brain as, as you go through. Uh, but personally, I think, I, I, I think like Duncan said at the beginning, I, I think the biggest impact on this side is the fact that we've been able to all not only reconnect, but stay connected and get to hang out with everybody uh, e either as little or as often as we can. And, you know, to even if it goes, you know, six months or 12 months, and then you get to spend some time with Duncan, you know, for breakfast at a convention or something that, you know, that's yeah. priceless. And, yeah. you know, you get to see Steven every once in a while, maybe we go have coffee, maybe we have breakfast or something, but to yeah. see him out and everybody's celebrating the same thing, um, you know, not everybody gets a chance to do that around something that they, with cool people that they worked with so long ago. Um, you know, and then really the, it, it it's just the way it worked out that Ashley and Ryan and I have spent so much time together over the uh, last, you know, <laughs> shit, it's 10 years now, um, doing so many neat things. Um, and look what that's led to, you know, we, we, we've seen everybody's family grow, we've got to travel, we've got to spend a lot of time and, you know, without something like that kind of the fan base that kind of sparked the resurgence that wouldn't have happened. And, you know, on another personal note, you know, it's something that, you know, Ryan and I got to reconnect after we both moved back to LA almost at the same time. And, you know, we, we had a podcast, uh, I created a show that was on Nerdist's uh, you know, uh, streaming channel called Alpha that Ryan and I co-hosted and we showcased short films and short filmmakers. Uh, I mean, not filmmakers that are not tall, but yeah. filmmakers that make shorts. And, yeah. you know, it's just, you know, everybody be able to connect that way. Yeah. And then, you know, I run into, you know, Michael and I live in the same neighborhood. So I get to see him at Trader Joe's every once in a while or something <laughs> like that. And, you know, that, you know, that's, that's awesome. And, um, I, I think it's just everybody, not only the fans being able to connect with each other and us, but us being able to connect with each other and 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 kind of relay these stories is 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 another parallel kind of interesting story. Very good, very good. Yeah. What was uh, going back to the oh, man? I gotta throw something in because when you were talking, Andre, tonight was the night. All those years ago. When I pushed Wolfman out of the attic with a stick of dynamite in his was that the, it was, that was Halloween. That was that was that was that's my right. little kid was there with me, my four or five year old. I mean, it, it, it flashed back. There he was. I stuck yeah. the dynamite in him and said, Suck on this, you son of a bitch, and throw him <laughs> out the window. 
And then I remember <laughs> right after that, an hour later, my little boy, who is now 37 years old, looked at me as one of his arms came back on the street. And he looked at me and he said, Daddy, how they do that? <laughs> it was that this was the night all those years ago. Wow. Yeah, that's right. That's... No, we were filming in October. That's right. Yeah. That, that was it. And then yeah. finally, I'll get off. 20 years later, he sees Grease on the other side of the street, Wolfman. And he runs over to him and he says, Wolfman, my father would kill me if I didn't tell you. I, my, my father, Stephen mocked. And he looks at him, Grease looks at him and he says, Tell your father I'm going to kill his son. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'm out of it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> so, Michael, uh, the question was, uh, what's what's become your favorite memory uh, of being associated with Monster Squad? My favorite memory, it was, it was just like working with the cast, everyone was great, and working with the kids, it was wonderful. It was really, truly wonderful. And it was a great, it was great to be a, a part of all, uh, you know, a part of that whole whole situation. And the funny thing, funny thing about it is afterwards, you know, it's like I felt really proud about playing the mummy and getting it and working with all these great people and everything. And the kids were great and the cast was great and everything was really, really, really great. But but the thing that really shocked me the most, as does everyone else, is like we had no idea it would turn into this cult thing because it didn't go anywhere. Then all of a sudden it was like exploded it's like monster squad and i was talking to this one person one time that said oh my god you were in the monster squad i said yeah and they said oh my god and then my my niece two years ago she came she she she, she, she we were having like thanksgiving dinner and she comes over with her boyfriend and she says because i'm sorry we're late she goes we just switched that we just got finished watching monster squad i said monster squad she said, yeah we just got finished watching because i love that movie I said, I was the mummy in that. She goes, get out. Are you kidding me? He was the, <laughs> he was the, he was the mummy in the monster. You were the mummy in the monster squad. I said, yeah. Goes, oh my God, we just watched it. Because I love that movie. I've been watching it ever since I was a little kid. And she goes, I love it. I love it. And she said, it's, it's, a, it's a classic. And she said, we, I have to watch it every year, you know, for the holidays. You know, and she goes, because that's it's, it's pretty wonderful, but it was a great experience. The kids were really, really, really great to work with, and um, and and the other actors. And it's, you're all wonderful. It was it was it was really a, a really happening experience, and I was so proud of myself <laughs> that I, I I I was so proud of myself that I got to play the mummy. <laughs> it was great. <clears throat> Uh, good memories, your, good your, your makeup was extremely intense. Uh, how long did you uh, spend in the chair? Actually, no, that was actually the mummy was one of the easiest makeup jobs I had because really? other jobs I've had, like in suit work and everything, took hours and hours, you know, whatever thing, what, and everything. But the mummy was, I just had a linen suit that I put on, and it was very lightweight. They wrapped, and then they wrapped me up additionally. And I put the hands on and the feet on were like booties, were like slippers. And that was it. It was, it was tops. It was like 45 minutes to an hour, maybe 45 minutes. That's not bad at all. All right. I'm well, kudos I, on that. I have a great memory was, of Michael really good. who played Eugene feeding Michael at craft services because he had his hat, his like face on and and Michael used to sort of like help you eat. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Little Michael yeah, little little Michael Costino who played Eugene. He was he was very protective of me. He would hold my hands and he'd say, Are you okay? And when we sit down, he would like look at me and he's very attentive to me. And he yeah. and like he says, and he cut my meat for me. And he'd, he'd take a nap and go, just a minute. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> it was very sweet. It was very sweet. Uh -oh. He was very very protective of me. Uh -oh. He made sure that I was. He, he made sure that everything was fine with me. And and can you see okay? He would guide me to the table and everything. He says, can you see? 
Yeah, he was very sweet. Uh, <laughs> that's adorable. Ryan, how's your signal? Yeah, he's very cute. I don't know. Is it good? <laughs> well, I can I can hear you. Can you hear us? Hi. Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry about all that. No that worries, bud. <laughs> no Ryan, worries at all. Can you, throw, can you throw some light on your face? I don't know what to do about anything. This is it. <laughs> This is what we get. <laughs> it's the Monster Squad. It's supposed to be dark and spooky. All right. Uh, our team let us know. We got good to go on audience questions. So I'll Yay. ask or roll our first one. And this is going to come from Brian, who wants to know, did anyone get to uh, uh, keep uh, a prop from the movie? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I kept traps. But, oh. then, but then in a, somehow scraps got put in a bag of stuffed animals that got put in a garage and somehow didn't make it into a move and scraps has since been lost. Oh no. I know. It's hmm. such a bummer. I'm so I'm still like, Mom, how could you let us lose scraps? Oh. I had the Dracula ring for oh. a while. I remember that. Oh wow. I don't know what happened to it. It was it was there one day and was visiting with Andre, and then the ring disappeared. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow! I don't think that's true. I don't think that's accurate. Hey, I don't did I say anything? <laughs> no. no. The, the I inference was, but I did have it. For, I did have it for you know a while. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, it'll turn up. Oh, I'm t- 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 I, I hope. I hope. So. <laughs> yeah, I hope, so. I hope so too. Yeah. yeah. I had the uh, I had my jacket <laughs> uh, for a while, <laughs> and then it was uh, a bag of mine got stolen out on a on a trip, uh, a Monster Squad trip, actually, where I was gonna bring the jacket to an event and uh, let the fans you know wear it or whatever they wanted to do with it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I fell asleep on a train in San Francisco and, and someone stole my bag. So oh. that, that, that jacket's gone. Uh, the only, the only thing I have is, uh, is this, you can see that. Oh yeah. That is the, that is the bullet that I put in the gun to, uh, uh-huh. to kill the wolf man. Cause you uh-huh. know, it's the only thing that does. <laughs> as the movie proved again uh, uh Sh- shane and fred you definitely tell they 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 went over all those theories that they themselves probably hashed out with their kids about but what if you just blow up the wolf man i mean yeah, it's not I, managed, silver. I managed to save this <laughs> yeah. nice. i recreated it <laughs> that's awesome still i'll take it I'll tell you. When we were in Austin, um, Andre, you had a wonderful museum set up there, really, of all a lot of the stuff that was a lot of props, really interesting things that I'd forgotten were even in the movie, you know, because we were looking at it so many years later, but it was really well set up. And I remember you worked very hard to sort of curate the whole thing and then film it. So there was a lot of stuff involved there. There, there was a lot of stuff. Uh, I had... Um, a great team of people to help out build because uh, mm-hmm. on the during the 30th anniversary year we right. rebuilt that we rebuilt the treehouse at the in the highball in the bar of the new Austin yeah. Alamo to the yeah. South Lamar South location right. and you know sourced all the artwork and everything and uh, a lot of the uh, props and and fan props and fan art a lot of people sent to us to put in that display uh, to add to the collection you know, that, that, you know, like Ryan and, and, and Ashley and Fred and uh, people brought in. Uh, but I, yeah, I have like a big box of stuff. And yeah. one of the awesome things that was in that display, Duncan, was your screen used cape uh, yeah. that yeah. actually um, one of our awesome fans by Ooh. the name of Andrew Norris uh, owns. Uh, Cause apparently he acquired that from the Forrest Ackerman estate and uh you know he has that as a collection and we actually got to go to his house and 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 put him on camera and the amulet was there that fred gave to eric vespi back in 06 um 
Rudy's bow was there, which um, uh, I've actually had since we stopped shooting the, the film. And then Ryan had it for a little bit. And then we were both in LA at the same time. And I, I, I've, Ryan and I actually took it over to a friend of ours house, Sierra Nielli, who's a very well-known animator and uh, artist. And it, he's got this amazing collection room and garage workshop. So it's kind of hanging in his shrine right now. Yeah. But the bow is a great prop mm -hmm. to have because it's so iconic. And um, I guess the one thing that I have, I have my whole wardrobe, but the thing that stands out the most is uh, I have the original Stephen King rule shirt, which uh, had been in a plastic bag and a biased, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it is very small, um, but it made a um, you know it made it makes a, a a debut at the end of the documentary. And the ring, Andre. Uh, I'm st I guess. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm I I don't know about the ring. I don't. I, if I had, I would be in a museum, or I would I would drive it back to you. Uh, I oh my gosh, I'm getting thrown under the hearse here. Okay, uh, Canada, oh, yeah. Andre, you can't go. Yeah, it, do what? You it's in Canada. To... Yeah. I'll swim. I'll drive to Seattle and well, swim the rest of the way. Well, the, the hearse is intangible anyway. I'll just pass through you like a ghost. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Michael, Michael, did you uh, do you have any mementos this... from the film? No, I, I, I did not. I did not. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to keep my feet because they're like they're soldiers and booties and everything, but they they had taken them apart already. So yeah, uh, that's but fair. No. I've been watching <laughs> that's about it. It's all good, Brian. Thank you very much. That was a great question to start us off with. And let's do another one. And this one comes from Adam. What is your favorite memory from the set? So if you haven't. <sighs> Wow. I think I think throwing the cops around was my favorite. <laughs> sort of, yeah. <laughs> not, it was not, a not, lot of fun. Not the infamous moment you scared Ashley with the surprise. No, that was the worst moment for me. She's terrifying. <laughs> that. <laughs> so scared. That's the most memorable moment, but I don't know if it's my favorite memory. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> yeah, really. Actually, that was my terrifying. favorite memory because I was standing <laughs> off to the side watching them shoot them. <laughs> And I was just <laughs> laughing my ass off. <laughs> That's just a <good> boy. <laughs> As the little girl cries. Oh, I loved it. I'm like, this is so good. This is going to look so good on film. <laughs> it's terrifying. It's perfect. <laughs> Whose idea was that to, to spring that on Ashley? Was that yours, Duncan, or did that come from Fred? Oh, I think it was Fred. Yeah, well, it had to be Fred. He came up with it. And, yeah, I'm, I'm sending him my therapy bills still. Yeah, absolutely. Mine too. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ashley, do you have a nice memory then? <laughs> um, let's see. I remember sort of like hanging out with the boys when we were not actually filming, mm -hmm. and because I was the only girl, I and the youngest, I felt so cool to be hanging out with all the like older kids. So I just remember kind of following them around and trying to like hang out with them. Like life, life imitates art, right? <laughs> and um, I wasn't allowed to eat sugar growing up. And I remember them sometimes like sneaking me candy from craft services and then my mom finding it and getting really angry. Um, <laughs> but you know, fun behind the scenes hijinks. Nice, uh, very nice. Michael, how about you? Yeah. Yes, there's there's one point. It's like Ashley was so sweet, and there's there's one part where I had to go up the truck, and and and, and uh, Fred said, "Look right in her face, you got to scare her," and it's like I didn't want to, but okay, so I geared up for it and everything, and she started to cry. And she goes, "I'm scared, I'm scared," and everything, and it's like, and and and, and finally Fred says. Show them, show them, show them that tonight you should. It's so like, I went like before my lip. <laughs> it's like, Ashley, it's me. It's Michael. <laughs> and so then we did it again. And I looked at her face. <clears throat> and she was fine. She, she, she did it like a trooper. <laughs> she had the scary reaction and everything. But she had to just go through that little, that, that, that little thing to know everything was cool. Everything was fine. 
And she sure. did it. I'm seeing a pattern here. It seems like the monsters yeah. didn't want to do anything to Ashley, but the, the boys, on the other hand. <laughs> I mean, you know, they were very nice to me. They were okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Good. So, uh, Steven, you said uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, the dynamite scene, but do you have another one that uh, sticks out as a favorite? Um, I, you know, the technical aspects of it, even as limited as they were, were a lot of fun. Um, in that dynamite scene, I remember Grease was there and the stunt coordinator was there and we had to have a fight and they wanted to throw me, they wanted Grease to throw me into a box, into a lot of cardboard boxes. And Andre was there and <laughs> they wanted me, he wanted Grease to pull me up by my chest and I jumped on this springboard that they put. So I, he, he took me like this. I went over the springboard. I jumped on the springboard, and I, he, it looked like he picked me up about eight feet and then threw me. So it was I got launched off this, this uh, springboard, and I thought that was a lot of fun. And then when they started, <laughs> and they brought out that propeller that, you know, it looked to me like a 10-foot diameter propeller, and they started that thing up so that there was the storm. I thought it was just terrific the way that, that environment was created with the leaves blowing all over the square. And I think it was at Warner Brothers. Um, it was fantastic. Those were a lot of fun to be. And then they brought a tank in at the end. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was really fun, a lot of fun. Uh, absolutely. Andre, bring us home. You know, I think, um... It, everybody's awesome memories are, you know, we can just interchange them almost. But uh, like Steven said, that that scene upstairs with Wolfman, uh, one one fun. <laughs> I'll tell the anecdote where I I'm, I'm kind of the goof, but uh, you know, I, I walk up and you know, Steven's just you know gotten beaten up, and you know, I say, "Hey, asshole!" and I have the bat and I hit him in the head, and so we're walking through how the blocking of that is, and. I think it was like, you come up, it's like, all right, here we go. Uh, you know, uh, say the line, he'll turn around, you know, obviously don't hit him, you, you know, do it short and get the camera. It looks like you hit him. It'd be great. So we come up there and the scene's all set. And the first take I walked up in there and came on camera and I said, Hey, asshole. And I think I just turned into like this kid with an imagination that was playing in the backyard by himself because I took the bat and I went, Hey, asshole. <laughs> and they cut. And uh, Fred came over to me. He goes, that yeah, was really good. It was a good swing. Worked good. But uh, don't worry about giving the sound effect. We'll add that in later. <laughs> and uh, I don't know why. I don't know why I did that. But I've always been kind of you know out playing in the yard by yourself and 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 yeah. being imaginative. I think I just fell into that. And I don't know why I thought I needed to provide the uh, sound effects for the film. <laughs> but uh, we had we did it again, and I didn't screw it up. <laughs> Ah, it's, that's... The star, it's the Star Wars actor syndrome. That's right. That's right. Like, don't, Very don't true. Don't do the word. Don't do the yeah. sound. <laughs> uh, so I was there for filming, I think, but I, weirdly enough, over the years, my favorite scene has actually become the scene with uh, Stephen and Andre on the roof. Just that scene there. We come on by and bring the to this, too. There's a, it's a nice, quiet moment. And in the movies, we don't get too many of those scenes between dads and sons. And... It felt very, very natural. Well, it was. It was a, uh, you know, it was just fun to be able to talk to him. Uh, you know, I had a little boy who was, Andre was maybe a year or two older than my little guy. And then I had older than he. So talking to him out there where we could just connect and, you know, have some popcorn or a Big Mac and watch a movie, which is yeah. what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You know, which was a very nice thing. And even in, in that sense, there is a kind there's a kind of loneliness that he was experiencing as part of the, being wrapped up in this fantastic adventure that somehow I was able to reach out and connect with him, not even knowing what it really was that he was experiencing until you know, I fight with Dracula and I go into the house and he's not there, which which really you know worries me. So that was a nice, really tender, sweet moment that we had on well, that on that. Uh, like I always said, uh, uh, Shane and Fred are, uh, both have a wonderful writing style of carnage, but they also ha have a wonderful way of injecting heart and sentimentality 
where you least expect it. So it shows up all at work. So Adam, thank you so much. That was a great question for us. Uh, what do we have next? From Jennifer. How did you prepare for your role in the movie? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I think it was a pretty easy uh, uh, description of my character for sure. Um, but I didn't really understand it until, or I didn't think it was any deeper than it was on the page until I was uh, in going for wardrobe and they were putting various jackets on me. And uh, the wardrobe person was like, oh, that one looks okay. Let me take you, let me take a Polaroid of that. Let me step back. Uh, maybe, I don't know if I like this one. And then she put this particular jacket on me and said, oh, this, this is it. This is the one. I love this one. And I said, I was going like this. Uh, I don't know. This doesn't feel like something I would wear. And she looked at me really closely and she said, you're not playing you. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> and then I started sort of going back and reading the script again and maybe like thinking, maybe I'm thinking too surfacey on this character. Maybe he's not who I think he is because I don't think anyone knows who he is. That's kind of the point of who he is in the film. I mean, Phoebe said it best. You know, I heard he killed his dad. Did he kill his dad? Like, is that actually a thing? Did that actually happen? How do we know? And why do people think that? There are many layers to that character. That I, I mean, I could talk for hours about it, I guess. But I think that's when I started, like, really preparing for, like, various facial expressions, the way I said things, and the way I treated the other kids. And, you know, why is this, why is this older kid want to be a part of something with little children, you know, that are like, you know, three years younger than him? Like, what is it? What's going on here? So there's definitely like a deeper, deeper thing going on than, uh, than, than maybe what people think. Right, Rudy was the coolest. It's like, was he? Was he actually like in real life in his own personal feelings? Was he actually like the coolest person in the world, that's going to be a no. <clears throat> Anybody that gives bullies their what for is cool in my book. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but why? Maybe, maybe he was getting bullied in his school. <clears throat> no, no, you're right. You're right. That does pose an interesting thing, too, which is what's what brought the character there. And uh, yeah, I think that I think that is under the surface. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So, so who's got who wants to go next? Well, there were some um, really interesting challenges with uh, offered with the role of Dracula, and probably not the least of which for me was uh, convincing Fred during the audition process and, and after that that uh, I had some pretty strong ideas about how to play him. And I, and I wanted to play him differently than he had been portrayed by, you know, in the past by so many excellent actors. And um, But I still wanted I still to retain the classic iconic aspects of him and, uh, to just sort of infuse the character with the right balance of uh, malice and humor. Um, he had to be extremely dangerous, of course, um, lethal without mercy. Um, and yet camp in his delivery to take, to take the edge off his nastiness and his dire actions. So. Um, in that way, he could be, Dracula could be less of a monster and in the beast wheel sense, um, and rather more psychotic and uh, more human and sociopathic. It was direct and exactly what he wanted. And uh, I think our, our darker human side can be so malevolent and complex and, and terrifying. And I felt that incorporating a lot of those darker aspects, I could uh, elevate Dracula beyond, beyond the idea of just being a plain ordinary monster. And um, you know, and, and I also approached the role as I do for a lot of uh, iconic characters, and that's to you know draw and paint them before I get into it. And that tells me an awful lot about what they're going to look like, and often reveals some of the inner workings of the character. 
Really? So basically, a lot of the approach that I took. Uh, do you still have some of your Dracula conceptual sketches drawings? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Are those published somewhere. anywhere? Somewhere in this vast labyrinth, there are <coughs> drawings. <laughs> I, I, Andre, you get on this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can have them. Yeah, this, this, yeah, this needs to be on this. I think I have some sketches anywhere somewhere, probably fast sketches and maybe a few finished things, I'm sure. Well, I know I know people would love to see those, so you should just post those or do something with them. But you know that I'm going to comment on Duncan's prep. I'm going to just say I'm going to I'll make you a trade that you know of the ring. I, know, <laughs> I knew that was coming. Um, I'll just I'll just roll up the sketches and put it right through the ring, and then. You know, yeah. um, but I I do want to comment a little bit on Duncan's uh, preparation because that's something that we as the kids in the movie we're not obviously privy to. But the end result, all of that prep and that and that that thought process that he put into that uh, ended up becoming what you know he may or may not know, but we hear it all the time, is one of the best, most people's top five, some people's top three, and a lot of people's uh, best favorite portrayal of Dracula that's been on screen. I I would concur, absolutely. Absolutely. And, we, have and heard he, that, we have heard that many, many, many times as uh, probably uh, as groups and individual that travel. So kudos where kudos is due. Absolutely. <laughs> and 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 you also gave the uh, there were moments of of gentleness with your Dracula too. You know when he's when he's resuscitating Frankenstein. It's just like is our time, old friend. You get the idea <laughs> again. That establishes a history there and. And yeah, even when in Wolfman's all tied up, it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. There's, there's sinisterness to it, but he's being playful too. So, and sure. again, absolutely agree. So, who's got another one? Hey, Ashley, how about how about you? Um, well, I was five, yeah. so was <laughs> I was not painting or sketching TV beforehand, um, or like thinking about why she is the way she is. But I was so lucky to be, I just able to be present with all of the wonderful actors that I worked with, um, particularly with Andre and with Steven and with the wonderful late Mary Ellen Trainer, who played um, our mom. And they, I think at, when you're a young actor, especially at that age, you really, you're just playing make-believe. And so if the people that you're working against are, um, or working across from are present and are generous actors, which all of these actors are, are it makes it just that much easier to fall into the the magic of belief that it's real. And I think that, you know, I would call Mary Ellen mom on set and I would call Steven dad and we would, you know, if you sort of had that camaraderie behind the scenes. And so like, I would say my preparation in some ways was just like immersing myself in the world and then having my mom like whisper the lines to me before the scenes because I couldn't read yet. <laughs> so I would like memorize the scenes of the day before they were coming up to make sure that I knew all my lines um, so that we could just sort of be present and play. Yeah, and uh, you did have that very sweet, the candle scene with with Mary, and that was that was another one. It's very I equal to the, uh, the boys on the roof, the other side of the family. You know, I being love the that scene. And fun yeah. fact, yeah. I actually had the sheets, the same sheets I actually had on my own bed, and I walked onto set, and I was like, those are my sheets. And they were like, no. <laughs> I was like, how'd they get here? Excellent. And I want to pick up on that. Mary Ellen Trainer really um, added a whole other dimension to it. You know, she was the center of the family. Um, you know, I'm married and I had four children at the time. And when I met her and I saw Andre, uh, I just adopted, they were just my kids. That was it. And she, she provided a very, she was a beautiful woman. She was very attractive. She was sexy. She reminded me of my wife. And I, I had known her outside that we had done one or two things, one episodes of something before. Um, so it was a very natural, easy uh, transition into this core family, the real human side of it. And she provided that warmth that beauty, and she was the mother. Um, and I miss her. I miss not seeing her as well. Yeah. Anyway, I wanted to yeah. say that. Yeah. 
No, mm-hmm. she had a, a really solid body work and mm-hmm. uh, indeed she is missed. Uh, Michael, uh, how does one prepare to become a mummy? Well, I'll tell you, I had seen a lot of the mummy movies, you know, when I was a kid and everything. And um, the one thing that always stuck in my mind, of course, was the drag in the foot kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I did several things like that when I was at the, when, the, when I was at the audition. But I've noticed too, and it's like after playing the mummy, I was so proud of this. And this is why I was so proud of playing the mummy. It's like mummies, are, mummies are very small. If you've ever gone to a museum, you look at a mummy, they've always been small. On the, on the screen, mummies were always portrayed as big and kind of like drag, you know, they drag the foot and everything, but they're tall. But mummies truly were, were, very, were very, very slight and small like I was. And that's one of the main reasons why I got the role. And Fred told me that too. He said, "He said, you are my mummy." <laughs> and um, so I'm really proud of that because it's kind of like here I am, this like little skinny guy, and everything, and I get the part of the mummy. And I was really, I was really, really portraying a mummy as a mummy truly is, very slight and small. Yeah. And also very scary. <laughs> So it was pretty cool. It's a monster in my closet, <laughs> <laughs> which I still I still is one of the biggest pops. Uh, you know that's that scene, absolutely. So, <laughs> Andre, bring us home. You know, I think with you know approaching characters, I, I I you know I think everybody's exactly in the right place. I don't know of anybody that you could you know, kind of who would you substitute and change this? I've I've always said nobody. I think everybody's exactly in the right place. And Stephen touched on a couple of things where, you know, the family, you know, even with Sean and Phoebe and the parents, it it all just, it looked exactly like it is out in the real world because everybody was very comfortable with everybody. And I think that has a lot to do with people like Mary Ellen Mm -hmm. and with Stephen because they were all you know, skilled v- veteran performers and had families of their own and, and made it kind of easy for us, really. Um, so that's always nice. We, you know, when you're when you're working and you're a kid, some things are they're either unknown or uncomfortable. And, you know, that can show across your face or, you know, show in your delivery. But uh, I think we all just kind of fell into a groove as a squad and then as a family and then as enemies, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, with with uh, the squad and, and the monsters. But you know, for Sean, I think it was it was just one of those things where you realize who Sean is. He's the, you know, he's that administrator. He's that kind of delegator and, you know, knows he can't do it without everybody else. But someone's got to kind of take the take the reins and be like, hey, let's do this, this and this, because I think this is happening and everybody's got their own skill set. So let's just, you know, be the manager and and I always, I always joke about being the insufferable know it all. So I think I got typecast in it, but uh, it was, uh, I, I think, I think everybody worked out just fine. I would absolutely agree. Jennifer, thank you very much. Great question. And GalaxyCon viewers, this has been the cast of Monster Squad, and that was our time. If you'd like to purchase an autograph, a personalized autograph, head over to GalaxyCon.com. But while you're there, be sure to check out our schedule of upcoming events just like this one. Panelists, any final words for our audience before we go? Thanks for coming. Yes. Thank you for being there. Great conversation. Yeah. And thanks for sticking around. And days and see you in person. You know, that's that's right. I miss you. I'm going to say the same thing. From his cage. Uh, Absolutely. (laughs) Gentlemen and lady, it has been my absolute pleasure to serve you all here today. Thank you once again for joining us here at the GalaxyCon virtual stage. Thank you to our audience for joining us today. And thank you for those great questions. Bye bye, everyone. Happy Halloween. Take care. And please keep washing those hands.